To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, Jesus gives the right to be called the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. Amen. Word of God for consideration today are words of the second lesson, the Apostle John's first letter, chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world, with its lust, is passing away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a common misperception of Christianity is that we are opposed to fun and happiness. And that accusation, frankly, has some historical basis. Especially in some times past, there have been certain branches of the faith that have condemned seemingly innocent activities like uh, dancing, card playing, going to movies, usually because they have some unsavory uh, abuses at times or perhaps uh, some unsavory kinds of associations. In the uh, small town where I went to school, there was a conservative Bible college that would conduct regular checks on the radios and stereos of the students in the dorms to try to make sure that they were not listening to any secular stations. Drunkenness, of course, is something that uh, the Bible condemns, but it is hard to be critical of having a glass of wine with dinner in light of what Jesus did to the water that he turned to wine at the wedding at Cana. So you can sip your beer and listen to jazz music while playing a game of gin, gin rummy or spades with your friends and not have to worry that you're somehow endangering your faith. It's not to say that the world does not pose some serious dangers to our faith at the same time. Even some of these innocent activities can become a problem when they become obsessions or addictions. If that beer that you're sipping turns into entire six packs or 12 packs at a single sitting, well, then we probably have a problem. Frankly, it's the same thing or something very similar can probably be said of that entire uh, half gallon of ice cream or family-sized bag of potato chips that get downed at a single sitting as well. A lack of self-control is bad for the soul as well as for the body. And then in our world, there are those kinds of behaviors and activities and beliefs that we cannot really describe as innocent as all. We still worship a God who has set certain boundaries. And he has said these things are no. The, the world, on the other hand, well, all it cares about is that you feel good. You feel good especially about yourself. And it, it really doesn't care much about the path by which you get there. I don't have to tell you that that emphasis on feeling good it sings to me. It's, it's, it speaks to something inside of us. We like it. And so in these words of uh, 1 John chapter 2, the Apostle John uh, in his first letter is uh, warning us about the, the dangers that are posed if we set our hearts, if we rest them too much in this world. John wants us to understand that our love for the world presents a problem. It presents a problem by the rivalry it creates, by the content it produces, and by the shortness 
of what it offers. John begins his warning here about love for the world by reminding us and warning us that it, it really sets up a rivalry inside of our hearts. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Before we get into the specifics of the dangers we should define by what John means by the world, he is not referring to the physical planet on which we live. Uh, it, it is not wrong for us to love the beauty of God's creation or to be concerned about the environment. Nor is John talking in a general way just about the population of the people who live in this world. He's not saying that we shouldn't love other people, that the people who make uh, the world up, and certainly God does. It's this same John that God used to write that famous passage in the gospel. We all know God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In fact, if anything, he wants us to share that love that God has for other people. But as in other places in the New Testament, when it's used this way, the world refers to the world in rebellion against God. It is, as one commentator said, all that is opposed to Christ. It's not the world as God created it, but as the devil corrupted it. And in this, uh, we have to understand that we, we may... Love the people who are a part of that world in as much as we are trying to rescue them from their rebellion. But we are not to love them as they are with the systems and the priorities and the cultures that they had developed to oppose God. That world is eager to convince you that it is your friend it is here simply to try to help you to be what you really are, to help you be a more authentic you. It wants to lead you to enjoy the same freedoms from rules and restrictions that it has uh, enjoyed. It, it denies that there are any specific negative consequences that go along with that approach to life. It, uh, it, it wants you to believe that God's demands, God's commands are unreasonable and that you need not follow them. In some cases, it wants to deny that what we think of as God's laws or commands are really God's own at all. So, what if we adopt this friendship? What if we become friends with the world? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If the Sooners play the Longhorns in the Red Hit River shootout or showdown or whatever they call it now, we can't pull for both teams. Only one can win the game. Ukraine versus Russia. They can't both win the war. If one achieves victory, the other one suffers defeat. And, and so it is in this uh, rivalry that the world wants to set up in our hearts against God. Y y you can't love them both. It's one or it's the other. The difference between this rivalry and the ones I just previously used by way of illustration, however, is this, that there are no ties. There's no negotiated peace. These two will not tolerate each other in the end. And so we must find ourselves on one side or the other. Will we love the Father or will we love the world that opposes him? Is it hard to see why it must be so? I love my earthly father. He gave me my life and my start in this world. He, he supported me all through my childhood. He, he sacrificed his time and his money to give me a better life. He continues to offer me wise counsel and good guidance even to this very day. Now, 
If you ever met my dad, you would know that he is a fairly likable fellow who has very few enemies. But if someone were to come along and to criticize the way in which he raised me, if they were to deny or to belittle the sacrifices that he made on my behalf to give me that better life, if they were to actually attack him and what is properly his to try to take away his own property from them, could I be friends with them? Could I still love them no matter how much they may be trying to butter me up and love my father at the same time? Does it not seem obvious that it must be one or the other? These are opposed. Now, we mentioned what the world tries to use as bait to get us on to its side. What about what our Heavenly Father has to offer? You and I would not exist if he had not made us. Every one of us is his creation. In spite of the fact that we have flip-flopped back and forth between love for him and love for the world, love for him and love for the world, he has continued to love you and me nonetheless. Later in the same letter, John writes, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He gave up his only son, his one and only son to save us. The world says it loves you too. And do you know what the world would be willing to give up of its own in order to save you? Nothing. So, any love we harbor for the world then presents a problem. It creates a, a rivalry in our hearts uh, against our Heavenly Father. Only one friend can have our love in the end. No one can serve two masters, Jesus once said. He will love the one and hate the other. Do not love the world. Perhaps we can understand this problem a little better if we also understand that loving the world has an impact on our hearts and lives, uh, that our love for the world presents a problem because of the content it produces. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. Our God has made us sensory even sensual beings, right? We have, we have skin, we have nerve endings. We, we, we have this, these senses of taste and touch and smell and sight and hearing. Those are all good gifts from God, gifts from him to be enjoyed. C.S. Lewis uh, once commented, the, the security that we crave would teach us to rest our hearts in this world and oppose an obstacle to our return to God. But a few moments of happy love, a landscape, a symphony, a merry meeting with our friends, a bath, or a football match have no such tendency. Our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant inns, but he will not encourage us to mistake them for home kept in their place, enjoying the sights and the smells and the sounds and the sensations that God has made his gift to you and to me are, are good and they're proper. And they, they in no way detract from our love for God any more than the, the Christmas presents or birthday presents I received from my earthly father ever somehow got in the way of my love for him. kept in their place. But that's the problem in a fallen and broken world, isn't it? In the world that opposes God, nothing wants to stay in its proper place, and we find ourselves forsaking the giver and obsessing about the gifts. We lust. We desire. We want. 
and, and that's not just limited to sexual issues, although it certainly includes those kinds of things as well. We want more than what God has determined to give to us. We, we, we want to satisfy our desires in, in ways in which God does not promise to give us his gifts. We want things that God never intended to give us at all. When we follow such lusts, when we give in to them, then we, we fall into the kinds of sins we often refer to as perversions. These are those kinds of sins by, we take, by which we take God's good gifts to us. They are good gifts, like, uh, like sex, food, entertainment, even authority, and we twist them and we bend them so they're no longer able to serve the good purpose for which God gave them in the first place. We pervert sex so that it no longer creates stable families for healthy children. We pervert food so that it no longer nourishes healthy bodies, but it, it makes us sick or obese instead. We pervert the arts and sports so that they no longer are filling our minds with noble thoughts or building good character. I mean, for examples, look in the deep past at the, the bloodlust of the Roman gladiator shows. Or look at the obscenity with which our modern world often tries to tell its stories in print or in film. We pervert authority and governing so that some politician may enrich himself or so that we end up imposing violence and war upon unsuspecting peoples who are simply minding their own business. This is another great problem with loving the world. John says here, in addition to this lust, there's pride. It leads to pride in one's possessions. Well, actually, John in the original is a little bit more general than that. He just talks about the pride of life. When we, when we lay our hearts on the world that obsess about its things and we love it, well, then we, we tend to get all caught up with me and want to promote myself. We become full of ourselves. We attach our own value, our own worth, to our cash, our cars, our homes, our, our degrees, our awards, our careers, our politics, our morals, our charity. Well, in, in that context, it is, it is possible even to take uh, something as uh, benign as our humility and our poverty and turn it into a way to try to make ourselves feel superior. This does not come from the Father, John points out. He leads us to recognize our lusts and our pride and to repent of it. He helps us to embrace his love, his grace, his forgiveness for our sins. And, and, and the more that we focus our love upon our Lord, the fuller place that he has in our hearts, the less that we are obsessing about uh, scratching every itch that we have or trying to make ourselves feel important. And we get down to the business of relieving the suffering of other people taking care of their personal needs and leading them to know the grace, love, and forgiveness of God in Christ. There is no small difference, no small difference between the product of a life lived in love for the Father and a life lived in love for the Lord. It's a problem when we love the world because of the kind of life it produces. 
Where does it all lead? Well, the shortness of what it all has to offer illustrates one final problem with our love for the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. So what does your love for the world get you? I think we'd all like to think that the people who live that way are filled with regrets. And perhaps we can even think of some genuine examples where that has been the case. Uh, a man trades a few moments of pleasure with his mistress for that lifetime of love and respect that he would have from his wife and his children, and he ends up living alone and miserable. That politician who sold his integrity so that he might enrich himself, finds himself in the ensuing scandal, losing his position, his reputation, and his fortune as well. And yet there are many, many people who are sinning their lives away, who are doing so with apparently no regrets whatsoever, and seem never to face any consequences as a result. They, they seem to experience no real consequences for as long as they live. Ah, but that's the key term there, or key phrase, for as long as they live. Because we know that the world that they love is coming to an end. The world and everything that it offers is coming to an end. The very people who love the world so are all going to come to an end. And it won't be pretty when it happens. The world with its lusts is passing away. The world may offer its fun until the end of time. But that time is short. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Don't misunderstand what John says there. He is not presenting you some kind of a bargain we make. It's not as though this is a business transaction with God. You know, uh, we do the will of God and then God pays us eternal life in return. Rather, he is describing the kind of person who puts their faith in God, the kind of person who has received God's grace and what happens in the life of such a person. However imperfectly they may love and serve, they are making doing the will of God a greater and greater part of their life. They are working more and more to love him and love others in what they do. Already now, it is filling in more and more of their existence. And that doesn't stop when life or time comes to an end. It remains forever because they remain forever. Only perfected and purified. It is safe to say then that that offers a lot more fun and happiness than the alternative. Amen. Please stand.